Um, so in addition to st making small structures, imaging them, studying them, um, so, so the nanotechnology, of course, can impact life. So there are lots of applications, and that requires you having very nice nanomaterials um, that, that, uh, and also you make nano devices. So there are many interesting nanomaterials, but I will just use one example, graphene. Um, and then also you can engineer other um, small structures on top of the nanomaterials to enhance or change the properties of materials. And that's called nano meta materials. And you can also have nano devices. Uh, you can make nano devices to have special functionality. So in the case of graphene um, and gra carbon, carbon related materials are very interesting. You can have zero dimensional buckyballs, you can have one dimensional carbon nanotubes, two dimensional graphene, one atomic layer, or you stack these layers together, it becomes graphite. Um, graphene has been heavily studied since 2004 and won a Nobel Prize in 2010 um, because of lots of exciting revolutions. So graphene, if I just do a cartoon here, uh, turns out that electrons in graphene can move ballistically with very high mobility. Uh, graphene one atomic layer light can, most of the light can get through uh, without uh, absorption. And then also uh, you have different uh, this called zigzag direction versus the armchair direction will have very different properties. Um, and then also graphene itself is like a very good filter because the separation between atoms is so small, this honeycomb structure is so small that only electrons and protons can get through. So you can use it, you can start imagining the, the, the applications. And then also it's mechanically extremely strong because graphene itself form uh, very strong bonds uh, in, in the two dimension. So the, the strength is like uh, 200 times stronger than steel. And so, so there are lots of good things you can use with graphene. And so a very quick thing is that, so this honeycomb structure, um, the atoms are separated by 2.46 angstroms, that's 0.2 nanometers. So you see these honeycomb uh, structures are really, really tiny. And then you can describe the periodic structures and then convert that to momentum space. So this is something high school students don't know, so I won't elaborate very much, but it gives you very interesting characteristics um, when you try to look at the energy momentum uh, dispersion relation. So, so the energy momentum dispersion relation for a typical semiconductor, you have a conduction band, a valence band, you have an energy gap. But graphene actually has zero energy gap and also the bands look linear uh, that means they behave almost like photons with, without mass. Uh, and then if you bring an STM, I would just talk about STM. So I bring an STM to this graphene surface, try to study it, and you can have this edge that's an armchair edge. And the corresponding tunneling spectrum looks a V shape. But then you, you also have these zigzag edges. And if you have these uh, zigzag edges, you bring your STM tip to look at the tunneling spectroscopy, it looks totally different. And so the material uh, along two different directions for the same material actually have different properties. Um, I think I'm, my time is uh, essentially up, but um, you can play with all kinds of things. You take this simple piece of graphene that I just show you, and I can try to distort it applying strain. So I distort it in a strange way that um, I would expand one of the these red positions and contract the other green positions, it turns out that if you do STM studies on such a strained graphene, it would behave as if you have uh, the tunneling conductance versus bias would behave as if you have, you, you see these peaks, these peaks actually correspond to very strong magnetic fields, it turns out. Um, that was a theoretical prediction and we demonstrated this way. We, we make these nano crystals and put it on silicon. Uh, and then we put a monolayer of graphene on top and we bring STM tip or AFM to look at uh, the behavior. So this is uh, just nano crystals. And then I put graphene on top, then it looks like this. I zoom in and you can see that uh, if I have two crystals, I have a wrinkle in between. Um, and now if I do STM studies, I bring the tip far away then um, the tunneling conductance looks like this red curve. That's what there should be when there's no strain. Um, the interesting thing is then I started bringing it to this um, strongly strained areas. You start seeing these peaks. 
it turns out these peaks correspond to some crazy, very, very high pseudo magnetic fields. Uh, they are pseudo magnetic fields because you don't apply a real magnetic field. The magnetic field can be positive or negative. So the total magnetic flux is zero. But the, when the strain is so strong, you can actually have as high as thousands of Tesla. Uh, and this is an image um, when I strain the graphene with the nanocrystal, and can, you can see the atom, this is a STM topography. So different colors indicate different height. And these are real atoms, and you can see that you really strain the graphene. Um, and you can also do nanofabrication and then put graphene on top of these structures. You can design periodic structures. Uh, so these are nano cones, and you put graphene on top. They started forming wrinkles. And if you zoom in, you look at the wrinkle here. This is AFM image. And then here is uh, uh, actually, it turns out you can convert that to gi giant su pseudo magnetic fields, positive, negative, positive, negative fields due to the strain. And this can actually induce novel electronic properties. That is, you send electrical currents perpendicular to the strain, uh, wrinkles. You can effectively split counterclockwise motion electrons and clockwise motion electrons. They are called K and K prime. And that has unique properties. Um, because of the interest of time, I won't tell you the, the physics behind it, but you can design these wrinkles and make a device, make it into a transistor device, so you can um, and, and see novel properties and receive dramatic novel properties. You can gate it by controlling the carrier density on the material. Um, so just to, to show you, these are devices that we fabricated, and I'm not showing you the data we are seeing because they are too complicated, but the data really show dramatically new behavior, uh, totally different from just graphene by itself. Um, graphene itself, this wonderful nanomaterials can also be used as uh, energy storage materials. You can turn, you can make graphene nanostripes to, uh, for, for energy storage. Uh, typically, people use um, active, uh, activated carbon, that's very junky materials from petroleum, etc., and they use that um, combining with other things for energy storage. But usually that's um, dirty, it's not very, uh, very good capacitance. Um, and people also try to use carbon nanotubes for this, and it improves things a lot better. But it turns out that if you can use uh, graphene nanostripes, it will be even better. And the idea is this, people, um, people originally, they take carbon nanotubes and they use plasma to unzip the carbon nanotubes, turn them into these um, flat sheets, uh, and then incorporate these into, um, into capacitors, uh, into lithium ion capacitors or for supercapacitors, lithium ion batteries or supercapacitors. But, but this process is, is costly. Uh, you have to make carbon nanotubes and you have to unzip them. And then we have been able to develop carbon, um, uh, grow carbon, one di quasi one dimensional carbon materials like this. Um, and, and then we can use them. And this, this is a spectroscopy showing that they're very high quality material and we can use them for very good capacitor uh, behave performance. So the point is that you can take um, th this process, you can take greenhouse gas and going through some plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition techniques, and you can make nice graphene for all kinds of devices, or you can make, uh, you can also use it for energy storage. And so, so this is one interesting thing that graphene as a, a nanomaterial. There are other nanomaterials that are called van der Waals materials similar to graphene. Instead of graphene, you change the carbon atoms to boron and nitrogen. Um, it will be like one sheet. Uh, that's, a, that's an insulator. This is a semi-metal. Or you can um, uh, stack these triangular lattice patterns of, um, of transition metal and then calcogen atoms. And then you look at them on top. Uh, it will look also like honeycomb structure. Uh, but then you have three atomic layers per unit cell. And these materials are very interesting semiconductors or superconductors, or uh, they can also be topological materials. And so all these nanomaterials, they're very interesting with nice properties. And you can start thinking about it's almost like playing the Lego. You can stack different materials and then they have different properties. You can even rotate the angle, it will create new properties. So, so th those are um, nanomaterials. Um, you can also play games. You can use your nanofabrication techniques or nano growth techniques to do different dimensional quantum dots. Um, 
one dimensional uh, nanowires, you can make photonic crystals from one to 3D. You can uh, design other materials on top of the nano materials to have new properties, or you can design some interesting three dimensional materials. Um, so I will go really quick. You can you can take some semiconductors. You can confine them to zero dimension, um, very like a, a a dot. So it's called a quantum dot. There are different ways of confining it. You can do nanofabrication like this and electrically confined it like this, or you can really grow materials with two types of semiconductors, one inside the other, and so one of them is three dimensionally confined. So electrons, holes, and any optical, uh, optically excited electron hole pairs, they are called excitons, they're all confined three dimensionally. Or you can also use other um, soft um, methods to make these um, uh, quantum dots. And these quantum dots are like, um, like uh, a zero dimensional, like they're like artificial atoms. So different dots, um, so, so artificial atoms, uh, if you have a bulk semiconductor, you have a finite energy gap. But then if you do quantum confinement, so, so some of you haven't run quantum mechanics, but in the future you will learn about it. Uh, when you form atoms, then you have different discrete energies. So this is like an artificial atom. And now if you have a bigger artificial atom, the energy separation will be smaller. And then you have a, a, a smaller dot, you actually have a bigger uh, energy gap. And so these semiconductors, then if you shine light on them, you will excite an electron from the valence band to conduction band. And then uh, that's an excited state, then the electrons will fall back and form a photon coming out. So when you shine light on these materials, larger atoms, uh, larger quantum dots would emit red lights and smaller quantum dots would emit blue or purple lights. So you can actually use uh, quantum dots for display and other purposes. That's zero dimensional, or you can confine your semiconductors to one dimension. And when you shine light on it, you can imagine that whether the light gives you gives rise to electrical field parallel to the wire versus perpendicular to the wire will have very different properties. And so you have new properties and also quantum confinement will also change your optical spectrum. And also these are like waveguides, so you can have different um, op, uh, different modes, like optical modes that can propagate through the waveguides. Um, so, so I cannot elaborate much on that, but interestingly, so you can do one dimensional um, nanostructures, you can grow them uh, or you can fabricate them. And then you can have a, an electron doped um, nanowire versus a whole doped nanowire and you cross them together then at this cross position, it becomes a PN junction as a hole and electron type of semiconductor junction. And these junctions will be showing very interesting optical properties. So if you shine light on this structure, then at this cross points, then you can absorb very strong light. And so these become a very nice photo detector. So you can use your imagination, understand your quantum mechanics and materials. You can make um, very, very nice detectors. Or you can take dielectric materials, pat, um, process them into one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional structures. And these are called photonic crystals. They're almost like atoms. And you atoms, you have um, atoms that form periodic structures. But now here you actually periodically uh, pattern them into longer structures, but these are, um, have compatible with wavelengths of light. And so these are called photonic structures. And you can use them for many different things. Also, if you only have one dimension, uh, one atomic layer of nanomaterials, um, even if this is like, for instance, this is tungsten disulfide, it has very interesting optical properties. But light couple, kind of couple weakly to this one dimension, uh, 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 one atomic layer material. And so what you do is that you can actually play games. You can actually put a, a spiral of gold nanostructure on top of it. And it turns out this gold will interact with this um, underlying one, one monolayer um, uh, semiconductor. And so when you shine light to it, and if you have, a, this is a right-handed spiral. If you shine a right-handed light, uh, light spiral to this uh, structure, you will actually get very nicely uh, right-handed spiral uh, light coming out. Um, even if initially, if it doesn't, do this um, very strong polarization. Uh, so, so the, um, and, and so this is an example that if you shine light on this material without the spiral, um, 
then, then the light that illuminates out, uh, it's called photoluminescence, is this weak signal. But then if you put a spiral on it, it turns out that then, then light uh, is enhanced with interaction with this tiny material. So this light emission becomes much stronger. So this is called a meta material. And then you can also use your imagination design using uh, different light beams to do interferences on some polymer material and create these called nano truss materials. So these are also done at Caltech by my colleague. Um, this structure was done in my group. <laughs> and, and then this was done by my colleagues. Yeah. Okay, so, so then you can also have nano electronic devices um, and they're very important for all kinds of things like for computers, for your cell phones, and, and also quantum computing and detectors for astronomy, uh, sensors for imaging the brain, for instance. Those are all nano electronic devices. We should really, uh, I will skip this. This is called single electron transistor. You use a quantum dot and you can, um, go to low temperature and then electron can only be putting one electron at a time and showing discrete energy levels. Um, that's called a single electron detector. And the idea is that you have these discrete energy states in a quantum dot. Um, it's like an artificial atom. And then when your electrons um, try to tunnel through, if it doesn't meet one of these levels, then electron cannot get through. But if it meets the level, then one electron can get through. Um, so, so it becomes very sensitive detection. And also quantum, you, you have all heard about qubits um, for modern quantum computation. The basic um, element is a qubit. And a qubit is unlike typical bit. Typical bit is in, in your computer is zero and one. It's deterministic. But in quantum computation, zero and one is not, you don't have to be deterministic. You can have the wave function that consists of partial zero and partial, partial one. So it's like you look into a, a block sphere, zero is the North Pole, one is the South Pole, but in quantum computation, the state can be anywhere in between. Uh, and so you have a lot more flexibility and then you can also design quantum entanglement for the, um, uh, from qubits. And that can give you much better computational power. So people are working towards that. And to do that, you may, um, right now, the most advanced technology to make a qubit is called a superconducting um, uh, Josephson junction techniques. So again, time is limited. So it's a Josephson junction. Let me just explain what it is. It's you have two pieces of superconductor and you have an insulator. Um, and superconductor has special properties so that you have very unique coherent behavior um, that you can do metrology, you can do very precise measurements. So you take this as a Josephson junction and you make a Josephson junction um, in connecting it to some electrical connections. Uh, and this is called a Cooper pair box. Um, you can actually inject one pair of electrons at a time, or you can make also a Josephson junction here, and you can use magnetic flux to control the properties. So sorry, I don't have time to get into details, but the idea is that you can control a two level system. Um, uh, one is at a ground state, the other is excited state, and you use this very precise control using a superconducting um, Josephson junction to control things. And with that, um, you can make qubits. And so that's basically the, the most scalable qubits that are being made these days. And also nanophotonics is everywhere for our life. All of the, like right now, we are communicating through internet, right? Wireless uh, and wire connections. So you have optical fibers going through it, um, going through ocean floors and, and you need to do, it's all related to optical communications. Um, actually the, the, um, the lasers that are being used in modern optical communications is also done by a Caltech professor, Amens, um, uh, Amens Yarif. Uh, and and um, so right now, because the internet information is so much, then we have to improve the laser and improve the, the signal propagation. And so currently, um, uh, this professor, Amon Yarif, actually further improved modern lasers that can increase the bandwidth of car um, carrying the signals much better. So sorry, I'm out of time, uh, so I won't explain how this works, but you get a flavor that all these things are directly impacting our everyday life. 
And also you can design other things. You can use metal or semiconductor dielectric materials. Use your um, knowledge and imaginations. You can make very interesting structures or nano lasers or um, very interesting on-chip control of light, for instance. All of these are based on nanophotonics approaches. Um, you can uh, also combine electronic nano devices with mechanical nano devices, and that gives you other characteristics uh, and, and functionality. Uh, for instance, electro mechanical systems, for instance, you can actually have an electrical, nano electrical mechanical nodes effectively detecting different molecules that's in the air. Uh, because different molecules will give you give rise to different mechanical properties, and that will be detected by electrical uh, circuits. And so this is electromechanical me processes. Uh, you can detect very small amount of masses. Um, you can spray a tiny amount of masses on a, a resonator that's mechanical. And this mechanical resonator is connected to electrical processes, and you can determine tiny, tiny amount of, of um, masses uh, with so, so there are things you can do. And then also you can have two superconducting resonators. You put them together, they are qubits. And then you can put the two qubits together and couple them, couple the, um, you can couple a qubit through a mechanical resonator. And then the mechanical resonator is coupled to an optical system. So it's called nano optical mechanics. And why do you want to do that? Because right now, superconducting microwave uh, systems with a qubits usually are at the microwave frequencies. And optical transmissions, you want to transfer signals to telecommunications or, or uh, satellite. And that's the optical wavelengths. And so they are not compatible with microwave. And so what you need to do is you need to convert them, uh, couple them. And so the conversion is through a mechanical resonator. So that's the idea. Um, so, so you can do nanomechanical, um, um, optomechanical, and then you can also make nanofluidics. That's very important for medical applications in the future. You can have lab on a chip. You can make tiny structures, and then they can deliver drugs, uh, fluids in a tiny chip. Uh, so these are ideas, uh, and the the fabrication for the uh, nanofluidics will be different from a lot of the fabrications I told you earlier. But I have to skip that. Okay, and so. So finally, you can actually apply all these wonderful nanoscience and technology to research frontiers as you already get a flavor. And I already mentioned qubits, right? Uh, I cannot tell you other things in uh, condensed matter, but it's heavily used in condensed matter physics. And in quantum information, I've mentioned to you, you can make qubits. You can also have two qubits to achieve quantum entanglement and also uh, quantum transducers. And also, you can integrate these nanophotonics for quantum networks. Uh, nano photonics and uh, atomic systems for quantum, ne uh, quantum networks. And you can also do bio and neuro science to study the brain or to have um, medical engineering. Um, so I probably should skip that. You take two qubits, and this is illustration. You have two qubits coupled into a mechanical system. And one is coupling positively blue shifted, the other is coupling negatively red shifted, but they are coupled together. And then you can actually design circuits to cause quantum entanglement of the two qubits. So th this is too hard, I won't go to it. But also you can also um, make uh, nanophotonic structures and you can put atoms on them. So the nanophotonic structures, you can design the periodicity and the dielectric constant so that uh, and choose it so that this creates an energy gap that's comparable to the discrete energy separations of an atom. And if you do that, then you can actually place atoms using light on the structure. So this was done by my colleague at Caltech. Um, they can really put atoms. And then why do you want to do this? Because that way you can create the structures you want, um, interestingly. But these atoms that you placed behave like very strong um, uh, mirrors uh, to reflect, um, to reflect light and to confine st structures. So you can make new systems that have very, that have novel properties actually uh, for, for, for quantum networking. I won't elaborate that. <laughs> and then, uh, and bio, you can do bio um, sensing drug delivery. Uh, you can detect um, uh, toxins in the air. Uh, you can you can implant structures into 
um, bio systems to look at the heart um, or the neural signals. And this is one example that my colleague put a, a tiny tip with devices on it. It's wireless, and so it can detect. So these are signals coming from uh, coming from the heart of a rat. And it was detected without wire. You don't have to attach wires to it because you build your wireless devices on a tiny structure, and then you can detect the signals from a long distance away. And this is finally done by my colleagues using to, to detect brain, to study all of the neurons in the brain. Um, they can make these tiny structures, put electrical devices on them or optical devices on them, and to stimulate neurons and pick up signals uh, from different devices. You can either do electrical or you can do uh, optical. Um, so, so these are structures that are being developed. The idea is that ultimately my colleague would like to study millions of neurons together collectively to see how neuron responds to excitations. So, so let me summarize, sorry for running really severely over time. Um, so you have seen, I gave you this just a, a, a a flavor of what happens in nanoscience and nanotechnology. It's highly interdisciplinary, and we talk about nanofabrication, nanocharacterization, nanomaterials, structures, devices, and then um, you can integrate them uh, for, for different purposes. And, and the invention and, uh, and the fast development in, in this area have really revolutionized fundamental science and also frontier technologies in a wide range of fields. And um, with Further creative developments, the impact, uh, we, we can imagine the impact of nanoscience and technology by all of you, if you want to get into the field, is like to do beyond our current imagination. And these are some images. Uh, you can, for instance, you integrate uh, optical devices, nano devices, then that's important for integration of uh, nano systems, uh, nano optical systems for communications. Um, you, and this is like, um, right now we talk about 5G, fifth generation wireless systems, and actually a lot of mobile devices require nano devices on, on a chip. Uh, and then you have to achieve all of the communications and a lot of the technologies rely on nanoscience and nanotechnology. Quantum information, you go from qubits and then how do you connect quantum computers to long distance to form a quantum network? You have to first convert your signal from electrical signals to uh, optical signals and transmit it um, through a quantum transducer and then connect it through uh, photonics to, to go to long distance, say, say through satellites. So all of these are also requiring not just nanotechnology, but also integration of nanotechnologies. So I will uh, leave you with this. This was, um, I started with the, you know, Feynman, Richard Feynman was a Nobel laureate and then um, this is also a Nobel laureate who invented, um, together with another um, colleague who invented uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. Um, so he said, you, you can see all these wonderful things all happen within just the past few decades. Uh, and they have major impact on science and technology. And so, so he said, um, the prospects of science and technology resides with the scientists themselves. It's all of you, if you become scientists, um, and then their ideas, their visions, and of course, their work. Okay, so I will end uh, with this. <laughs> Sorry, I went severely over time, uh, but I hope you've got some ideas of this field. Thank you, Professor Ye, for showing us the depths and various applications of nanotechnology. There's a lot to learn, a lot to, to talk about. But it's a pity that we don't have sufficient time for Professor Ye to elaborate on that. Although we are a little bit over time, but I still want to keep a five minutes interaction time for our audience. I believe all of you have many questions. You can use the raise hand function on the meet to directly interact with Professor Ye or write down your questions in the chat box. Uh, should I stop sharing right now? Um, either way, you can keep it there. Maybe there are some questions that are related to your PowerPoint. Okay. So you don't yeah, in, in, in case I have problems with it. Because <laughs> last time I had, to, I had to cancel it and then restart. Otherwise, yeah. it didn't send it. Yeah. OK. So, uh, so if I would I see raise hand or not? Yes, we do have. 
uh, Chi Hong, our very smart boy from our team. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay, so teacher, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so, okay. so good morning, teacher. So I have the one question for you is the, um, because you mentioned the e beam so this method can use the voltage to acceleration the helium or neon gas atoms and to agent the something the waste or the holes in the material. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, because the helium and the neon, this is a gas, that is true, but they are very light. And the elements inside the others, the heavy gas atom like the protons or the radons, and those are very very heavy, the mass is the very high, the gas atom. So if we to use this kind of heavy gas atoms and to replace the helium or neon, the gas, so can we to get the highest efficiency or the, um, uh, or the fastest to each in the material? Yeah, um, so, so yes, the, the answer is yes. And so that's why gallium is very good. Uh, and so, so, I mean, that's a good question. So gallium is good for, um, for develop, gallium is much heavier than helium and, and neon. And therefore it's good to remove a lot of materials if you want to make, remove a lot of materials. But the heavier the atoms are, uh, the, the ions are, uh, the more damages you can also create. And that's why you have to be careful on what you want to do. Um, so you, you can, dis so, so currently, commercially, there are only three types of ion beams available. Helium, neon, that's very recent. It's only less than, less than 10 years. Uh, and gallium is longer time. Um, so, so basically, and also you have to also figure out how to create uh, energetic ions. And the reason why gallium is easy is because it's, it, it, it melts at low temperatures. So you can, you can vaporize it more easily. If you use something like, let's say you take something very heavy like, uh, like iron or something, then, then it will be almost impossible to, to turn ions into um, iron. I, I, I'm sorry, iron ions. <laughs> uh, it will be hard to do that, right? Uh, it will be hard to make. And so, so, so there are restrictions um, in terms of instrumentation. And, and then also when the atoms get too heavy, you really cause too much damage, uh, to, too severe damages to your sample. And so, so one has to be careful on what to do. And that's why helium and neon is a very good compromise between electrons and gallium ions. Yeah, but, yes. but you got the key point. <laughs> yeah, and also I saw a student said, yeah, you can ask the question in Chinese, uh, no, no problem. And, but I may have to reply in English, depends on what the questions are. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe many, many students still have questions, but should we keep the questions in text or can contact Professor Ye after the talk? Um, I believe there are a lot more to talk about, but I think we, sh I think we should arrange another session in the next <laughs> season <laughs> to invite Professor Ye to elaborate on many more applications of nanotechnology. And before we meet again, I believe we can contact Professor Ye for further questions in private or through TTSS through us. Yeah, thank you. And then feel free to send me email messages from this audience. Yeah, sorry, I, I occupy too much time, so I don't get to answer you directly, but I can arrange a separate time to answer your questions. Mm -hmm.